Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Richard Granin and Friends. We have today the pleasure of Dr. Paul Taylor joining us again. Thank you very much for coming in, sir. My pleasure. Um, so I'm going to start with the hardest topic, <laughs> but I'm going to do this in a philosophical way, which I think actually like it protects us. It gives you plot armor as a character in this podcast. <laughs> I'm not convinced, but continue. We'll try. We'll try. So, um, the Israel Hamas conflict. Yeah. I wanted to ask you because I've been asking myself this. Um, philosophically, is there a way that we can approach this that doesn't rely on prejudicial? thinking that doesn't rely on our previous conclusions that we've already given ourselves about the subject. Is there a methodology that allows us to approach this in a way that is trying to be fresh, trying to look at the situation as it is today? I would give you a very odd answer to that. I'm expecting one. In the sense that what I've been working on recently, you know my shtick for a while, and it's partly your fault because you asked a question about what are the consequences of people not reading anymore? Yes. Which is what I'm fixated about. Yeah. And that's been bugging me for ages. So I went back to things like the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. And the Old Testament, as we would call it. Um, and also just the, the idea about reading proper literature. Yeah. And why I mention that is because I'm sure viewers and listeners are thinking, what's that got to do? That you know, the least thing to do with Hamas Israel. Mm. Except you've intimated... If you try and discuss the issue, yeah. there isn't a discussion. Right. And I would suggest part of that is, um, don't get me wrong, I don't want to be misquoted in any shape or form. A lot of what's happened in the recent debate is virulent, terrible anti-Semitism. Mm. And I'm, so I'm not excusing that for one second. What I would say, though, is that the, and I, it's not an excuse. I'm just trying to, there's a reason, uh, an explanation, the difference in an explanation and a justification. Yes. So I'm not justifying it in any shape or form. Mm. It strikes me, though, that it's confusing symptom with cause to think that the, the current anti Semitism has anything to do with the actual conflict. Okay. Because the vast majority, when they say from the river to the sea, mm. you can go on YouTube and see people when they, they say to some of these uh, protesters, mm. um, which river, which sea, they don't know. Okay. So that would be one immediate issue I'd, I'd, I'd raise is the lack of literacy, historical literacy in this in this um, sense, geographical literacy. Mm. They don't know why they're so angry. So that's one section of the protesters. Okay. The other section, there are virulent um, Hamas Islamist anti-Semites. Okay. So that's fueling. That's a whole other, that is partly what you're alluding to also. It's the long history yeah. of anti-Semitism from that quarter. But what, not that I'm mostly interested in it, but what I find, the, that I don't think you're ever going to solve. So... To, to be specific, what you're never going to solve is the strain of just knee-jerk anti-Semitism that underlines a lot of the, the narrative around Well, the us. Islamist anti-Semitism, I can't see a quick way. And one of the reasons to take it back to the issue of literacy is my reading of um, Islamism in the West mm. is that it's predicated upon a fundamentalist reading of the Quran, which cannot be altered, cannot be changed, and it isn't up for discussion. Yes. Why I've become increasingly interested in the, the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament is that I'm fascinated by actually how surprisingly up for grabs interpretations of it are. Okay. And even if you're a fundamentalist reader of the Bible, which there are surprisingly few, mm. it's fueled the whole of Western culture and how we understand literature and how we uh, our, our culture is absolutely immersed, whether we like it or not. And this is something Tom Holland, the historian, has spoken and written a lot about. Mm. Whether you like it or not, um, Western Europe and America is a hugely Christian-influenced, old Bible-influenced culture. Yeah. And that is, um, within that culture, there is ambiguity, there is interpretation. And again, bringing it up to the present, what you see is a lack of discussion, a lack of nuance. Um, you have people who it's the purity 
of the so they're, they're acting in an anti-semitic way but my reading of it is they have this stalinist like a desire to have a purely left-wing um moral conviction that they are right mm. and unfortunately at the moment it's israelis and jewish people who are the target mm. so i think it's partly accidental it happens to be jewish people because the october the 7th events occurred the horrific events then and there was silence, even Gary Lineker for once shut up, which mm. is a minor miracle in itself. Mm. So he managed to shut up for two or three weeks. And then the Israeli retaliation occurred. And then the virulent anti-Semitism comes out. So the, the Israelis and the Jews got a, ho- a honeymoon period of three weeks. And when I say honeymoon period, they weren't subject to anti-Semitism for about three weeks. Mm. Because even the worst of the of the British and American left realised, you know, maybe we shouldn't say anything at this point. So um, I have to do something a bit daft, um, but it, it it's again plot armour for us. Um, you you don't like the death of innocent civilians, regardless of their religion or culture, isn't that true, Doctor Paul Taylor? Absolutely. But one, and again, when I say but, it's it's so easy to be misinterpreted. Mm. What's happening in Gaza is horrendous. But one of the problems when you try to discuss any of this is um, the way in which public discourse has evolved in recent years is context isn't allowed. So the minute you try and talk about context, um, the whole point about cancel culture, you can't refer to history because you're fact-shaming people. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> you, it happens at universities now. If, if you correct it's, it's someone. The term for this is called fact shaming. Fact shaming. Seriously, haven't you heard this? You shame them with facts. Yes. And that's a crime. Well, it's ideologically oppressive. It's patriarchal. To stick to the facts. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you leave academia again? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Okay. So let's go back. Um, because obviously it's it's an incredibly sensitive uh, subject. Oh, sorry. Can I finish that thought? Yeah, go on, sorry. sorry. Yeah. So, I just can if I can give you some of my own personal context. Go so, on. because I don't want anyone to think I'm virulently anti-Palestinian, whatever. I taught a lot of left-wing political theory for my whole career. Mm. When I was a young student, I knew a lot about, unlike a lot of the students now, I knew about the Balfour Declaration. Yeah. I knew about the partition. Mm-hmm. And I was, I've always been largely sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. Yeah. And there were issues that would annoy me, um, not so much the Israeli state itself, but the, the behavior of settlers yeah. over quite a few generations now has sometimes been quite outrageous. Yeah, uh, you know, egregiously bad towards that. The idea of um, I've had slight problems with for what it matters, who cares what I think, but uh, the, the notion of the right of return. Okay. So the fact that Jewish people anywhere in the world had a right to return to Israel. Okay. But you could be a Palestinian who'd been dispossessed within recent living memory, and you wouldn't have a right to return. So at the time, that struck me as you know somewhat um, fundamentally, intrinsically unfair. But to be honest, everything for me changed with October the 7th. Right. Absolutely everything. And again, it will give you, um, it goes back to my my strange starting point about um, why does it matter that people don't read? Mm. There was a poem and every, I I believe most Jewish people and every Israeli have heard of um, Chaim Bialik. Mm. And he wrote a book called In the City of Slaughter. Sorry, he wrote a poem in the city of Slaughter. And it's a very famous poem. And the first line is something along the lines of arise and go to the city of Slaughter. And it was based upon a program in, uh, is it Kishinev, I think it is. Apologies if I've got that wrong. But it was part of what's now modern day Moldova. So Kishinev was a city in modern day Moldova at the time in 1903. It was part of the Russian empire. Mm. And there was a program where I think, I I don't want to get the numbers wrong, but it was a very small village, but about 50 uh, Jews were murdered, women were raped, and loads of people were attacked and badly injured. Mm. And then I think two years later, there was a program as well in the same city. And in that period of history, in the Ukraine as well, there were a series of programs that were basically warm-ups for the horrible events of later years with the Nazis. 
So Bialik wrote this poem and it's a very, very powerful poem. Um, and I'm try- I've, got a, I've got a book from 1924, which a woman called um, Helena Frank did a very odd translation. But I'm trying to remember the first, the first couple of lines of something like, um, of steel and iron, hard and cold and dumb. Um, hard and cold and dumb. And it talks about walking into, forge thyself at heart and, O oh man, and come um, and walk into the city of slaughter. It was a very odd translation. Most Jewish people won't be familiar with that translation because um, it's completely different to the normal translation. Mm. But it's a heartfelt um, and there's a version online that people should go and read. And why I mention all this, what's a poem got to do with anything? Why it's so significant is you read that poem and it's very, very similar to what happened on October the 7th. Of steel and iron, cold and hard and dumb, now forge thyself a heart, O man, and come and walk the town of slaughter. Thou shalt see with waking eyes and touch with conscious hands on fences, posts and doors, on paying in the street, on wooden floors, the black dried blood commingled here and there with brains and splintered bone. Good Lord. It go, it gets, it's horrible. And yeah. sorry, this isn't the standard translation, okay. which we could talk about that another time. I'm fascinated by the act of translation. Yes. Yeah. This is an odd, that was an odd translation, but yeah. an interesting one. Halfway through the poem, there's a, there's a baby suckling that's mm. killed. Mm. Um, and there's, there's, I'm assuming it's the narrator, or I'm assuming it's a man's walking through this town in the aftermath. Mm. And I haven't seen all of it, but I've seen some of the footage from October the 7th that most people have, some mm. of the video footage. And the similarity, the parallels are horrible. Mm. So my point is, if I was Jewish, and I'm familiar with that poem from mm. 19, I think he wrote it in 1904, the events of 1903. 120 years later, almost the same horrific things are happening. Mm. And that was my revelation that I've often been slightly suspicious when people said uh, Jewish people deserve the right of return no matter where Mm. they are in the world. I was Mm. thinking, that's unfair. You can't have your cake and eat it. Mm. I've often thought Jewish people saw anti-Semitism everywhere. Mm. And I thought, no, you're being, you know, the equivalent of being a hypochondriac, you're being Mm. hypersensitive. Mm. And it dawned on me, um, unless you're Jewish, unless you're familiar with that type of poetry. Mm. And again, why poetry? Why does poetry matter? Because poetry, um, not so much poetry, but the written word for Jewish people, Mm. it's what kept Jewish people together for 3,000 years, Mm. carrying the Torah around during the diaspora. Mm. And I think of all the peoples on earth, um, Jewish people are probably most text-based. Mm. most word-based. And it's. I'm always going back to your question to me, why does it matter that people don't read anymore? Well, the flip side is reading kept the Jewish people together despite this type of horror. Mm. It's the thing that kept them together. Mm. It's the thing that gave them their identity no matter how widely spread they were. Because they're a people of a book. People of the book. Mm. And in, in Western terms, the the blue herd crazies that are jumping on the Hamas bandwagon, they are, we've had this conversation before, but largely functionally illiterate. Mm. They are not people of the book. Mm. And I'm not claiming just because you read, you're somehow so much better. Mm. But my point is there's um, a certain type of reading that's open to ambiguity. Yeah. A certain type of reading that you learn the minute you read difficult literature, you realize there isn't a single truth. Yes. Everything is contextual. Yes. Which doesn't mean there isn't a truth. Yes. I'm not being a postmodern relativist, but I'm just pointing out, um, you know, there's, there's jokes, you know, if you want um, four opinions, have two Jewish people in the room. Mm-hmm. The, this idea that, that a midrash is the Jewish tradition of interpreting texts. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jewish scholars have argued for centuries mm-hmm. over very small issues. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what I've always loved about literature. And isn't isn't this like um, part of the more positive uh, self-deprecating 
Jewish stereotypes, what they perhaps it would be claimed that's why they're good at stand-up comedy and why they end up in why they end up as psychotherapists often is this tradition of arguing over the most minute detail with absolute fervent passion. And there's also an interesting thing. I, and I'm not I'm not selling religion to people. I am mm. a devout agnostic for mm. what it's worth. <laughs> um, and I'm, you've had, I think, a similar Catholic upbringing. Yes. I don't think you have the faith anymore. No, no. But intellectually, mm. I'm very, very comfortable. And I, I, the stuff I'm working on at the moment is the Judeo-Christian tradition and the Greco aspect of it. Oh, so the Greek, God bless you. May the, the gods bless you. Well, the Greek, Roman and Christian tradition. Wonderful. And how that's so crucial. Yeah. And sorry to keep repeating myself, but the blue herd crazies, they, they have separated our culture. They are the manifestation of our culture moving away from literacy. And people don't think it matters until I think increasingly look on the streets mm. and see it matters. Yeah. Because these people don't understand history. Mm. You can't engage to go back to what how you started this mm. chat. Mm. How do you engage with people who have a Stalinist conviction? They are right from the get-go. Mm. I, I don't see it. Whereas I can take you to passages in the Old Testament where there are just many different interpretations. So I'm working on, at the moment, if you know the Tower of Babel story. Mm -hmm. From memory, it's only about 18 lines of verses. It's very, very short. And it's absolutely, you begin to unpack that. It's an absolutely fascinating story with fascinating implications. Mm. To, to give you one little example, the idea that um, God somehow punished when they built the Tower of Babel, you know, so high it was going to reach the heavens. The common understanding is God punished people by destroying the tower. And no, read it. Basically, God had said to people, go forth and multiply, go and spread around the world. And what the Babylonians did wrong, in a sense, was they tried to concentrate in cities. And they had one, um, it, I'm working on this in such detail, but there's a cuneiform in the Babylonian Empire mm -hmm. was this one overarching, almost like Esperanto, it was the universal mm -hmm. written language. So there was this whole focus about one language, one massive Babylonian conurbation. And the idea implicit in the Bible is that you go forth and multiply, you need diversity. You need to spread out. You need to have different languages, different modes of thought. And what I'm suggesting is you think of that from 3,000 years ago. Is that is that really what that, that Tower of Babel story is about? Well, God, God said, or it could be. This is the pro okay. this is my point about interpretation. Okay, okay. Uh, you will get you will get fifty people now saying I'm talking nonsense, but my point is there's a legitimate story to be told. This is really, really important. And uh, it's it's vibing with some of the thoughts that I've had recently. Could you possibly pull up the Tower of Babel story, please, mate? Um, because the point I'm trying to emphasise is, again, people, what's he on about? What's this got to do with anything? We are living in a time where there is a univocal ideology. Right. That's almost like Babylonian cuneiform. You're not allowed to deviate. This is interesting. We, we don't talk that much, and yet we... <laughs> Every three months, I'll meet back up with you, and we seem to be on the same page. So the word, there's a word homogenous. Uh, is there a word hom homogeneity? Homogeneity. Is, homogeneity. Yeah. So there's a. Um, I, I, I want to pick you up on a, on a few points here, but just to say that we we seem to yet again have come to a place of of. Uh, for, for me, it's for the social media. So your your thing is post literacy. I'm very concerned with social media this homogen homogeneity that social media usage creates is incredibly fucking dangerous. Well, remember a while ago when we did, we, we don't chat that often, um, which we should try and rectify. Yeah. But I had to go at you about using a uh, Kindle. Yes. And this is, so Yes. for listeners and viewers, I have worked in technology um, from my PhD. It was about computer hacking. Mm. So I'm not going to take lessons from people on being a technophobe. I'm right. not. Yeah. I have an iPad. I'll explain how I use it in my, um, the way I read and stuff. I mm. use technology all the time, but I don't have a mobile phone mm. because A, I don't particularly, you know, a misanthropic bugger, but also just be on a train, look about mm. and see how many people are looking at a screen. Yeah. I'm able to, um, the thing about iPads more so is that it's slightly a, a um, 
atemporal, asymmetrical. You can choose, sorry, asynchronous. Mm. You can choose when to go on a laptop or you Mm. can choose when to go on an iPad. Mm -hmm. I use my iPad far too much, Mm. but there's still a choice. I can leave it in a different room and go and watch telly or go and walk the dogs. A mobile phone, people are never off it. And we could talk maybe about, because you're really into your fitness. Mm. I'm obviously not. And this is one of the things I've been writing small bits about is that people don't think anything of, what would you say when people exercise? In an average, it was two hours a day for people who are really into their exercise. Yeah, yeah. That's not excessive, is it? An uh, hour and a half, two hours. I mean, it depends, yeah. what, it depends on what you're doing, but if you are a gym goer and you love it, you're in there for an hour and a half, two hours. Right, so over a week, yeah. you're talking a good 10 hours. Yeah. And when I, so when you're talking about use of technology, there's that, there's the people are willing to spend 10 hours of their life doing something Mm non-technological. But if I said, so I'm working on Proust at the moment and I'm working on it, I will talk about it later perhaps. I'm working on this book that's basically about all the ridiculously long books that you should read, Mm -hmm. but you never will. Yeah. And why you should read them. Yeah. But one of the reasons people never will, one of the reasons people won't go and look at the Old Testament is that the idea of actually spending the amount of investment of time into reading is somehow unrealistic. Mm. They're not going to do it, Mm. but they'll spend 10 hours a week at a gym. Yeah. Now, just working out on a very practical level, I don't know what people's reading speed is. I read about 100 pages an hour. If I'm just reading, I read 60. If I I always have a pencil, I'm always making notes. Mm. So I do about 60 pages an hour making notes. Mm. But let's say that even if someone's a relatively slow reader, they're doing 40 or 50 Mm. pages. Well, those 10 hours, that's 500 pages a week. Yeah. You could read a a long, you could read War and Peace in three weeks. Yes. at At that rate. At that rate, if you spent the same amount of time reading as going to the gym. I've found myself, I heard myself do it a couple of times uh, saying like, if I read a book, I'll say, and I read it cover to cover. And I'm thinking, what kind of a weird, if you got like some insecurity, why are you telling people that? And it, and then when I thought about it, it's because I know perfectly well that in the modern world, when people say, I read that book, they did half the audio book, a couple of Wikipedia entries, and they've read the book. And I know that they haven't. I know that they haven't. I just read uh, cover to cover. Um, uh, Beyond Beyond Good and Evil by Nietzsche. I, I I do say cover to cover with Nietzsche as well because also that's hard. <laughs> it was it was painful. And people will tell me they've read Nietzsche and they'll always say they've read Beyond Good and Evil. And I'm like, why have I never heard then the amazingly funny passages about Nietzsche taking the piss out of the English, how we can't dress, our women walk like farmers, we can't sing. Really funny. And praise for the Jews. They're not, they're not chapters. They're not written in chapters. They're written in sections, Nietzschean sections. Praise for the Jews. Praise for Jewish culture. Open, full-throated, absolute praise. They're in a sense. I've never heard anyone. So you've got all, sorry, in my world, YouTube videos that are saying Nietzsche, 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 beyond good and evil is an essential text. And I'm thinking, if you'd really read that, wouldn't you? none of you have brought this up? It's quite funny. You know, the, the stuff on the English, it's a total piss take about English culture and how dreadful we are and how we can't be bothered with this, but good natured. And then this, because if you go into Google, through the search terms, you'll see people will ask, was Nietzsche an anti-Semite? And then there's a lot of hang ringing and people, well, we don't know, maybe. Read him. Read him. Let him say. It's right there. So that's why I say I've read it cover to cover because I really think people are saying, I've read that, but what they mean is, eh, I skipped I skipped a few chapters, I skimmed it. And just while you're on that topic, just to give people a sense that, you know, how non-technophobic I am um, and also how re- exponentially and ridiculously pretentious I am, mm. um, there are, so I'm not totally against audio books. No, no, I'm not. I'm not. So I'm doing work on, I'm, I'm going to keep saying I'm doing work on mm. because I'm working at the moment on the notion of the Western canon. So I'm looking at all these difficult mm. books. Mm. But James Joyce. Okay. Now, Finnegan's Wake, Ulysses, these type of books actually help to hear them sometimes because of the way he uses language. Right. Samuel Beckett, I've all, I am a really, really miserable person. And I actually enjoy reading Samuel Beckett. See, I didn't argue with you at all. I just sat there politely looking at you. (laughs) But we'll talk, if you let me talk about um, 
um, Valmar Shalimov later on. There's a funny story about how miserable you can be <laughs> or I can be. But with Beckett, for example, you listen. If you read Beckett plays and you're unfamiliar, it's sometimes difficult uh, to know what's going on. But you listen to Beckett on an audio, a well-performed, and there's some brilliant actors have performed Beckett. Mm. It brings it alive like you wouldn't believe. Mm. So there's one play, uh, Crap's Last Tape, mm. which is absolutely brilliant because he does a lot of stream of consciousness. Mm. And if you ever go on YouTube and find there's Samuel Beckett, there's a performance called Not I, mm. and it was the female actress Billy Whitelaw was one of his favourite actresses. Right. And it's a curtain, and it's just a mouth. So they do a scaffold behind the theatre curtain. Mm. So they position her mouth right high up. Mm. It's about eight, nine foot. Um, and the, the stage instructions are very specific. And it's big white uh, lips. So they're painted lips. And all you can see, the whole theatre is dark. And there's one spotlight mm. on the mouth. And it's a stream of consciousness. I've forgotten for how long, but approximately 20 minutes maybe. Mm. It gets faster and faster and faster. And it is absolutely awe-inspiring. Mm. It's stunning. Mm. Reading it, good luck Nothing. with that. Yeah. But to see it performed. Yes. So anyway, so that's one example of what, how audiobooks work. I'm reading uh, the Divine Comedy, Dante. Mm. And what I'm doing there is there are all these different translations. So I did Spanish like you did. Mm. You can actually understand quite a bit of Italian through Spanish. Mm -hmm. If it's written. Yeah. Mm. So I got the original in Italian. Mm. There's three or four different translations. And mm. just observing the differences is fascinating. Mm. But then also with an aud audio book, you can actually, I listen to the Italian original being spoken in Italian. Mm. So you're getting everything. Yeah. You're getting, because it's Terza Rima. It's this da-da, da-da, da-da. You need that to hear it. Mm. Then you read it in Italian. Then you read the translation. Mm. So it's a bit of an effort. I'll give you that. Yeah, yeah. But... What you're getting back, because the technology allows you to hear a brilliant mm. um, Italian speaker mm. bring this alive for you. And you can get good translations. Mm. So the technology can be double-edged. But in all of this, I'm, you know, the, like you and I, without pumping ourselves up, we're not typical. Mm. And you refer to YouTube. A lot of, if you find a YouTube discussion of Nietzsche, mm. It's performative. Yes. People are talking about Nietzsche so you don't have to read him, is what you were basically saying before. Yes, yes. Yeah. And the people, it's entertaining to see intelligent people talk about stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people watching some of these discussions would be shocked if they did what you suggest, if they actually read the original. Yeah. So Stephen Hicks is a bet noir of mine. He's on, he talks about Nietzsche a lot. Yeah. Um, a sophomoric understanding of Nietzsche. Yes, I listened to I listened to Nietzsche and the Nazis yeah. by, by him, and I was like, "Wow, this is GCSE level." And he'll, but he'll have hundreds of thousands of views, and it's a, a profound. I don't, I don't, because it, it sounds. I'm going to insult him, whatever I say. Mm. He's either doing an honest job awfully mm, because he's not very bright, or he's deliberate. He's bright enough to misrepresent it in a convincing way. Mm. So he's either being manipulatively deceitful mm. or. He's heraldically thick. Yeah. <laughs> heraldically thick. <laughs> and honestly, because it's that bad. And he talks about postmodernism. Um, and it's the, I don't have a go at Jordan Peterson because I like it lo in lots of ways what he does, I admire. Mm, mm. But, you know, Jordan Peterson has a sophomoric understanding of what postmodernism is. Oh, but I don't want to go down that well, road. Well, we, we, we did, we did do yeah, it I once always, it, it's like Tourette's with me. Postmodernism. <laughs> um, so let's move on from that. And it was highlighted in the uh, debate, the so-called debate between our mutual hero, your friend, yeah. uh, Slavoj Žižek, when they were just sat there talking across each other about communism, Marxism, and postmodernism using, well, one using the correct definitions and one using, I don't know, like coloured by crayon or... That is, well, they were just wrong. The definition is just wrong. But I guess you've seen, I gave a talk with Zizek in London and mm. I, I witnessed firsthand the free song. Um, people get excited because um, it could be Zizek, it could be Jordan Peterson, mm. any public intellectual today, mm. there's a free song in the audience that's palpable mm. because they're bright people talking about fascinating ideas. Yeah. But it's like a shaman. Now, because people don't read. This is why I'm always bringing it back to the fact that people don't oh, read. Oh, he's the... 
Yes, he's the one wise man in the village. He knows magic. What do you mean? He takes that thing and there's words in the thing. There's people in there. No, there isn't. These lines, they mean things. No. Yes. He's making it up. No, he's really reading. Yeah, yeah. That, that Like a shaman as in the one fucking guy amongst a bunch of shit kicking farmers. You can actually read a fucking book. And I would say the mod, one of the modern versions of that is, and I used to know huge tracks of poetry off by heart. My memory yeah. shot. Yeah. Well, I was telling you before about too much Nigerian Guinness. <laughs> but if you can actually quote three lines of poetry. Mm. It's the modern equivalent of walking on water. <laughs> Seriously, how many people do you know can quote big chunks of poetry? I, I quoted uh, in a in a debate uh, not that long ago. Uh, it was it was Macbeth tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. People's jaws dropped. Yeah. I'm like, a I got half of that wrong, and B I only did fifty percent of it. But the fact, like, and I was, is that Shakespeare? Yeah. Well, which, God bless my, my late father. <laughs> he, he left school when he was 14, 15, but he, he did uh, the To Be or Not To Be soliloquy yeah. when he was seven. Wow. And he died and is at about 85. Mm. Um, he could recite it yeah. to his dying day. Amazing. And again, why does this matter? But it goes back to this thing about the October the 7th, the response to it. Mm. I think the Jewish visceral response to what happened on October the 7th mm. is based upon deep cultural affinity with texts like the Bialik poem. Mm. To be Jewish is to know this stuff in your soul and in your guts. To be a blue herd yeller on the streets mm. requires the exact opposite. You know no poetry. Mm. You know no history. Mm. You're not prepared to discuss anything. All you have is this uh, Jacobin purity that you are right. And the reduction to slogans. Which let's, you don't even have to go onto the trans issue, but there's, I was watching recently um, to try and make this very specific to people. Mm. Is it Dilla Hunty? I think that's how you say it. No, there's a guy. There's a guy online who d who does debates almost professionally about um, atheism. He's a professional atheist. I think he's Matt Dillahunty. Yes, yeah. And um, could, the, could you just check that? I think wasn't. Yeah, if I'm thinking of the right guy, yeah. then yeah. Well, he did a rage quit recently. Yes, because he's got a complicated private life. But I saw him. He did a debate with Dinesh D'Souza, who's an interesting character. Is it this chap? American yes. atheist activist, yeah. yeah. He he's done a rage quit recently. Yeah, with, um, and is it Andrew Lawson or something? I've, I've, okay. I'm useless on names, but there's a yeah. professional wind-up merchant okay. who's an um, Eastern Orthodox apologist. Oh, okay. He's an American guy, but he's yeah. part of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Oh, okay. And he's, he, he's very obnoxious, but mm -hmm. very, very bright guy. Mm -hmm. But, so I'm jumping around, but this Matt Dillahunty was in a debate with Dinesh D'Souza. Mm -hmm. And Dinesh, it was about religion. Mm. Um, and it was about belief in God. And Matt Delahunty's constant position is to say, I'm about reason. I'm about rationality. Mm. You're talking about this bogeyman in the sky. How mm. ridiculous. And then Dinesh D'Souza started talking about trans issues. Mm. And um, Matt um, Delahunty just started talking over him, saying things like, um, a trans man is a man. And, you know trans people, trans women are women. Mm. And I'm thinking, well, now who's not being purely logical? Yeah. Who's not, who's now not being purely factual? Yeah. Who's now being, asking you to believe in something yes. that's not scientifically based? Yes. And, um, and reducing the whole nuanced debate to a slogan, and the, a meaningless and, slogan. And he played to the gallery and you hear the audience are on his side and Dinesh D'Souza, you could see him thinking, oh, I'm not going to win this one. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. the point is, it's not about then how clever you are at debating. It's about, can I beat that slogan? Yes, a slogan's a big club to bash somebody over the head with and you can just repeat, repeat, yeah. repeat whilst they're trying to form a uh, high resolution analysis with nuance and uncertainty, as you said, and interpretation and I'm built sorry, into I'm the- I'm trying to keep dragging this back to October the 7th because mm. I'm trying to talk as widely around the issue as possible. Because, well, I did- give it I some did, focus. Yeah, I did say to you, how do we, before we even get into what do you think, what do I think, and the death of civilians, what, how do we, frame the debate. And this is all yeah. completely relevant to frame it. Before we begin the debate, how do yeah. you frame it? And this is my point. You're talking about 
on, and I am, obviously, there, are, there will be more moderate people who you could have a discussion about the Balfour Declaration, the British Mandate, all these historical facts and mm. complicated issues. Mm. But generally, you're, I, I don't think it's too much of a caricature. When they say, shout from the river to the sea, mm. go, like, you know, go into, you can see on YouTube, pop, uh, vox pops, people talking to what river, what sea, do you know? Mm. They haven't got a clue. And is Israel in the way of the, that river and that sea? I mean, and then what's the implication? Yeah. What so, is the implication? So why, why I mentioned the Bielik poem was, my point is there are two different responses to October the 7th. There's the visceral Jewish response based upon familiarity with thousands of years of the written word and emotional connection to things like the Bielik poem mm. that are incredibly powerful. Because guess what? This isn't the first time they're at this particular awful party. This no. has happened before. And the, the point about the blue herd people who have no sense of history, no sense of literature, mm. how can you feel, empathise? How can you even begin to think about October the 7th? Mm. I would suggest what happened during October the 7th was so barbaric mm. that most of us, I won't, if someone said, here's a video, I won't watch it. I'm not watching that stuff. No. I, it's, it lingers. I'm not I, I, I don't understand if some Jewish people wanted to bear witness. Yeah. But I know I've read enough no, I'm good. to know that this is, I'm sorry, I can't watch it. No. But how, as a, as a privileged Westerner, some of the people taking a pro-Hamas viewpoint, how they compartmentalise what happened on that day mm. is absolutely beyond me. And then the point would be, well, how do you compartmentalise what's happening in Gaza? Yeah. And... The only way I could explain it is there's a coldness does descend. Mm. When something like October the 7th happened, I, I get the strong sense if I was Jewish, I would basically be saying to myself, whatever it takes. Mm. You know, th they've said it before, but never again. Mm. Mm. And what's happening in Gaza, you know, I, the, the, if children are dying, they're children for God's sake. Mm. So I've always thought it's like debates about the death penalty when, when there are miscarriages of justice or when terrible things happen, that if I believe that something is still the right thing to do, that's on my conscience, mm. but I won't pretend it hasn't happened. So I'm prepared to say, look, who knows? I'm no military commander, but I would still side on the Israeli side mm. because of what happened on October the 7th. Mm. Um, but I'm fully aware of the horrors that also what happened in Gaza. The difference is, I would suggest, there seems to be this Western cultural amnesia already about what happened on October the 7th. Mm. How, how you can criticise the IDF whilst never fully acknowledging, fully discussing what happened on October the 7th is beyond me. I just heard Douglas Murray making that point uh, yesterday. We've looked um, at the response, but not at the initial wound that created yeah. the response. And in the field of narcissistic injury and, and narcissistic abuse, um, that's, that's called reactive abuse. So you only look at the response of the victim. You only judge the response of the victim. You don't look at what was done to the victim before their response came. And that's, that's, it's a narcissistic tactic. Um, and, um, and in saying that, I'm not taking a side. I'm not taking a side. I don't want humans to suffer. So all I can trot out are trite aphorisms because I, I don't understand this properly. In the beginning, I would have said, uh, it's asymmetrical and the response is disproportionate and it's uh, irresponsible um, and looks genocidal. And then as time went by and I thought about it more and more, and the way I tr tried to frame it was um, because I'm a bit thick and a former bouncer from Liverpool, if it was a sci-fi movie, because you get movies like Dune, uh, sorry, books like Dune that become movies and they're, they're about real people. They're about real cultures that I'm putting a fictional. And I say, okay, if you try to do that here and take away your Richard's prejudicial view of everything that's gone before and everything of your understanding of the world, Balfour Declaration, you called it the right to return. I also have very big questions about that. I mean, I just don't, I don't buy it either. And yet the question that came back to me was, 
What would you have them do? What would satisfy you? Ah, okay. So now you're, no, go on, go on. You're in the driving seat. Go and tell them how to respond to the, to the, to the threat that they face. I do think the, the response is disproportionate. I do think you're looking at decades of belligerence and mistreatment of the Palestinian people. And yet I don't have an answer to that question. What should they do? Sit and wait, let it happen again. The, the nature of the conflict on the ground and even, even the geography counts, how close they are, the tunnel system that's underneath that. The fact that you, so people say they have such a young population there. And I'm like, yes, young and open to radicalization as all young, even young people in the privileged West are, because we're talking about radical leftists, they're radicalized. Of course they're pro-Hamas. Why, why would they be anything else other than pro-Hamas? If you're young and you have the big enemy, of course you would be. So then you have a largely pro-Hamas population who are saying we have to eradicate, not fight, not push back, not fight for our rights with, but eradicate that state. What? So me to me, my question to me, and I haven't answered it. What would you have them do? What would you, what would you like them to do? And I don't, I mean, tactically, you know, you're saying you're not a military commander, neither am I. Do you go back and reoccupy? Do you, and, and, and what, what good would that do? Well, I think the revelation for me was, and I, you know, I'm from the, at the sidelines, but you mentioned you haven't, you know, taken a side. I think I did for what yeah. it's worth. I yeah. just, yeah, who cares? But I, that October the 7th, I took a side. This isn't negotiable. This isn't, you know, let's, let's try and find a middle way. This isn't Keir Starmer bullshit. Yeah. This is existential. And we use the word existential. Mm. I've studied existentialism. Mm. The concept of an existential threat. If you want a definition of an existential threat, watch the bloody videos from October the 7th. Mm. Mm. And regarding the, the Gaza situation, yes, it's terrible. But one thing I haven't seen often discussed is why won't any um, nearby Muslim countries take those palace, incredibly vulnerable Palestinians? He, he asked, knowing the answer. Well, no, for example, the Sinai Peninsula. Yeah. If Egypt, if you cordoned that off, mm. if the world got together and paid Egypt an obscene amount of money and said, give that to the Palestinians, mm. and that would be some type of geographical, practical solution. Yeah. Just brainstorming. Yeah. Why that? You know that's never going to happen. No, it's never going to happen. Right. The Egyptians do not want them. Right, and it reminds me to a slight tangent. I saw Douglas Murray give a talk in somewhere like Abu Dhabi, and um, God, he's brave because the audience, the the comp, the presenter was biased against him, badly biased. Mm. Um, she was an Arab lady from memory or Lebanese or something. Mm. Um, the audience were giving him a hard time as a Western colonialist. He had a black American uh, professor doing the whole diversity spiel at him. Mm. And he was getting it from all sides. Mm. And part of I'm watching this and then I realised, <laughs> hang on, every member of the audience has stood up and given a, a Muslim-centric criticism of Douglas Murray. Yeah. And, and they're talking about British attitudes to refugees and stuff. Mm. And I'm thinking, there are parts of the Middle East, like Lebanon, that they've taken in huge amounts of refugees, like ridiculously, mm. a third of the population is suddenly a refugee yeah. in certain parts. But there are very, very rich oil states yeah. who have taken zero and but have done absolutely nothing. The UAE, where I was living, when... That ha when October the 7th happened, I was there. Had I walked down the street anywhere in the UAE and shouted, Allah Akbar, free Palestine, and waved a Palestinian flag, I would not be sat here now. I would be in prison. Because in the UAE now, if you criticize any country, if I criticize the UK or anywhere, it's a potential seven-year prison sentence. Potential seven-year prison sentence for a public criticism of another country and no criticism of, of Israel. Well, we're catching there. up in this country. If you use the wrong pronoun, it's probably about five years yeah. now. <laughs> but you can bur you can burgle people's houses at will. That's and okay. PC that's, plod won't, you know. Well, that's decolonizing the uh, the capitalist space, isn't it, to burgle someone's house? Um, and I I was stunned by the response. I was like, I'm in a 
this is a Muslim theocracy. This is an Islamic theocracy. It says it on the tin. They're not, they're not hiding it. You can live here, but it's an Islamic theocracy. And I said, yeah, that's fine. I'll follow your rules. I'll live inside of an Islamic theocracy for the trade-off of what I get from being there. But I was stunned by the silence. Like nobody's saying anything. And this is a bit of my opinion. Um, I think framing this as, as, as religious now based on the developments, the recent developments in the, in the Middle East is, is uh, disingenuous. Meaning if you say this is about Muslims versus Jews, it really isn't because where are my Muslim brothers and sisters of Umar? Where, where are they in this? Yemen has done something and said something. Um, that's it. Well, can I give you an analogy? When I, in the 1980s, I spent a bit of time in America and I'm Liverpool, uh, born and bred. My father's mother and father from County Clare and County Kerry. Mm. So in terms of blood, if you want to use the, you know, Nuremberg purity laws, mm. I'm much more Irish than 90% of the Irish rugby union team. <laughs> they were all, you know, mercenaries, most of them. Um, but that's, anyway. why, that's why you've gone back to your Guinness via Nigeria. <laughs> But I would have this constant problem because it's what you've just said. It makes mm. me think, why is the Muslim community in this country so pro Hamas? And it makes me think it was when I was in America in the 80s, the number of arguments, because I'm an argumentative sod, but I mm. wouldn't take any crap from Irish Americans mm. who at that time were supporting the IRA. Yes. So I think what they're called NORAID. They gave... Yes. Um, support to the IRA. Mm -hmm. And you might remember there was a little boy, was he three and a half? Um, he died in Warrington. Mm -hmm. uh, that was after I came back, I think. So until not that long ago, the, the IRA were bombing on mainland Britain. And, and, until not and the that guy, long ago. the little boy who died in Warrington was Catholic. Mm. So I, I, I just had these arguments with Irish Americans. And my point is, Irish Americans had this need mm. to overcompensate because they were distant from the actual geographical entity of Ireland. Yes, yes. So they had to be more Irish. You go to an Irish bar in America mm. and it's this surreal, hyper-real, more Irish violins, nail crucified to the wall like Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tricklers everywhere, yeah, yeah. oversized units. Yeah, which, which, by the way, Irish people hate. Yeah. They hate all that. They think it's very silly. Except this is one of the ironies. That there's this hyper-real thing where um, there's a load of bars in Dublin mm that are basically Irish theme bars because yeah. Americans would go to Dublin and say, this isn't Irish enough. Yeah. So th Where's the, the bicycle hanging from yeah. the ceiling quaintly? So the American reinvention of an Irish pub has mm. reinfected Dublin. Yes, yeah. And because you want the tourists to realise this is, and it, on and on it goes. <laughs> you but, have to scream at them, this is Ireland. Do you think that might be an explanation why the, the British Muslim and the American Muslim community are so... Um, but I think because nearer the actual geographical area, there will be Arab Israelis much more reasonable. Oh, you've opened a door here. Yeah. Shall, shall we go in? We'll go. We'll go through. The, we'll go through the Islamic door. Um, so, yes. So to to reiterate your point, so that people know what you're talking about. My father was born in Pakistan. He was born in Ralpindi. Um, I like saying that to Uber drivers in Dubai because uh, like one in one in three of them will go, brother, you don't look very, <laughs> you should get some sun. And I'm like, no, I'm white. But my father is Irish and he was the son of an Irish soldier and they were stationed there. And I was talking, to, I've got um, Pakistani mates here and uh, some Pakistani mates over in, over in Dubai. And what's happening and what's been happening for a long time in... Uh, Islamic culture, let's say, because people say Islam, like it's one homogenized product. It is not. Emirati Islam is not. Egyptian Islam is not. Tunisian Islam is, it's, it's, they, there are different interpretations in different cultures. Saudi Arabia first arrested their Sharia police and told them to stop enforcing Sharia law, I think as far back as 2016. Can you check that? Sh uh, Saudi Arabia arrest, arrest Sharia police. They're now going to permit alcohol in Saudi Arabia. So the hub of, of Islam and particularly Sunni Islam and particularly where it's that more bitter, uh, resentful, violent and extremist breed of Islam, it comes from Saudi Arabia. It would be called Wahhabism or Salafism. Well, the home, uh, whereas there's that from 2016, thank you. And they must be more kind and gentle. 
and they they didn't. It says they stripped the religious police. When I say they arrested them, they uh, not all of them, but the heads. They put them up in a five star hotel under force and said, "You have to stay here, and we're, we're not doing this anymore." So Saudi Arabia and the UAE, year on year, in a competition for white Western tourists, are becoming less and less strictly Islamic. So yes, at the source, well, Saudi Arabia is the source of that's that's where you go uh, um, on uh, Hajj. Uh, that's the source. It's becoming diluted in favor of a new religion or the religion, which is money. So the big thing here, when I said, I don't like, like we can talk about Muslims versus Jews. It's important, but I think that's the, <clears throat> that's the, that's the level of the foot soldier. The foot soldiers think, oh, this is a religious war at the highest levels. I think these people, I, I'm a conspiracy theorist, you know, I suspect there's a lot more collusion at the highest levels. And the big thing is money. The big thing is just money. So to come back to your point about American Irish being more Irish than the Irish in that hyper real way for years now, for since I used to live in Malaysia, which is a Muslim country. And there's obviously there's a lot of Pakistani students there um, back in 2009. And then you, you would see the modern Pakistani, the modern progressive Pakistani is not the same as people here from from uh, Pakistan, the, the, that's the that's the culture that we have. Most Islamic people, most Muslims are, in this country are Pakistani. They've got a way way the the actual Pakistanis from Pakistan is way more progressive. It's calm. It's open. This is not Salafist Wahhabist death to the kafar Islam. This is brother. Do you want a cup of tea? You want to like hang out? Come to my house. So welcoming. So warm as they're supposed to be, as is correct in Islamic culture, because if I'm Muslim, I'm supposed to invite you. I'm supposed to say, look how civilized we are. If I'm talking historically, we are the civilized ones. We are the most hygienic. We, we, have, we have this structure, we have this discipline, we have science, we have progress. Join us because it's better over here. Don't you agree, brother? If there is only one God and his name is Allah, come to us. It's that style when it's in Pakistan, not everywhere. I'm not being a utopian. Obviously, there is aggressive uh, extremist Islam there as well. Of course, the average Pakistani person is just living their life and saying, yes, I'm Muslim. If you're interested in Islam, I'm not going to proselytize to you, but I can tell you. Here, you're surrounded by the kuffar. You're surrounded by whites. They drink, they eat pork, they're promiscuous. They're not religious. They don't even follow their own religion. They These people don't even understand their own religion following Christ, who's one of our prophets, I would say, if I was a Muslim. Look at the decadence. Look at the degeneracy. What can we say? I mean, yes, they, they, they are actually, in some of their analyses, right. And it breeds uh, a combative stance and it's not welcoming. It's not, um, come and join us. It's cool over here. We want you because we're supposed to invite people to Umar. We're supposed to bring people in. It's, we're going to fight you. We're, we're, we're um, the minority inside of a, a body that is a foreign body that is not warm to us and we're not warm to it. And so, yes, you then become, they, they made movies about this uh, years ago, uh, Three Lions, about how ridiculously overcharacterized um, some British Muslims could end up being because they're trying to be more Islamic than people I from Islamic what, countries. To back up what you're saying, what exacerbates the whole situation is mm -hmm. in the major British institutions, so let me get my Tourette's-like abhorrence for the BBC out the system. Mm. But in places like the BBC mm. or at TV executives, mm. what fascinates me now is attitudes prevalent within the BBC or in TV advertising mm. strike me as the guilty conscience of white public schoolboys being manifested visually. So you, you watch TV adverts in the UK now. <laughs> oh God, go and on. Go on. Well, go on. I'm not standing on that landmine. You well, can, no, I'll happily, you, I'll you I'll first, happily stand on you it. First my understanding is, and if, I, if my statistics are out of sync, please let me know. But approximately 15% of the UK are from ethnic minorities. Yeah? Goodbye, YouTube no, channel. No, listen, no, no, and it's not. I'm <laughs> quite on. happy to say this go because on, I'll on. tell you exactly why. Go on. So out of that 15%, I think about 5% are Afro-Caribbean or black. Mm-hmm. In the adverts, apparently there are only mixed race families now. 
But interestingly, I, I can't remember the last time I saw an advert, someone with a turban. You very rarely see anyone um, Chinese. Oh, no. Yeah, go on. So I won't stop you. No, no. So there, there are, and for example, I, I don't often get the sense that I'm, I'm watching in TV adverts traditional Nigerian British families. It's, my point is, it's a very, very specific London-centric concept of what an ethnic minority is. It's got the facts and figures up on screen. According to the 2021 census, the total population of England and Wales was 59.6 million. Oh, I need to stop saying 66 million. 59.6. So I said five. It's actually yeah. four. Yeah. Yeah. But to watch adverts, uh, it's there's very few white people in adverts. It's ridiculous now. But my point is, and again, it's not that I'm keeping count, believe it or not, it, but mm. it's got to such a stage that you're thinking, hang on. Um, what are they trying to tell us? Okay. Just and it's the, a guilty conscience of TV executives, which isn't healthy. No, which we can prove because, just to back up in case people didn't catch your point, we don't see Sikhs. No. But there are Sikhs here. Um, we don't see Chinese no. here, but there's plenty of Chinese here, and they have been for hundreds of years. Like in, in Liverpool, yeah. they've been here for hundreds of years. Um there's a certain type of representation. You said you don't see a Nigerian family in traditional uh, Nigerian dress. You don't see... That. So they'll say, we'll give you diversity, but of a very certain type. And it's a kind of... It's like a weird, you said guilty, pathological fever dream of diversity. But it's the worst form of patronization. Oh my God, it's patronizing. Pa yeah. <laughs> oh, but you're patronizing a section of the population because you haven't got a clue. Mm. So we want to say, like, how would you know they're a Nigerian family? But how about a visibly mm. African family, mm. probably the mother shouting at the kids to get back to read the Bible. Yeah. Really, Nigerian with a, mothers. With a, with a sandal off ready to <laughs> Seriously, Nigerian mothers, the, the Nigerian mothers I've met had scared the bejesus out of me. Bible in one hand, sandal in the other. <laughs> to beat but the that, is, that is not a form yeah. of ethnicity that's acceptable to TV executives. It's a real part of British, being a British black African. Mm. But why wouldn't that? Because guess what? Christianity, what well, you were saying before, Christianity, mm. never mind anti Semitism and Jewishness. Mm. Um, Christianity is, we basically now we have uh, blasphemy laws in this country. Go on. Well, we never, we've never had blasphemy laws. But yeah. now, uh, recent events, teachers going into hiding, things have happened in this country where you do not say certain things. Because there's a new religion in town. Yeah. Whereas you can say from the life of when I was a kid, the life of Brian. Yes. Now that couldn't be if it went to the University of Sacrilegiousness and got an emeritus professorship in mm. being sacrilegious. Mm. That's a pretty blasphemous film. But, but guess what? Yeah. Christians saying, oh. Well, it's, uh, it's only mocking Christianity and that's allowed. And they're all white men and they're silly anyway. So Except all, all one, one before I forget one aspect of, do you remember that there's a section in the life of Brian where oh, yeah. he, he decides he wants to be a woman. Oh yes. And now the, the, how things change. Yeah, that, yeah. that is, that was the height of ludicrous. But you haven't got a uterus. It's ridiculous. Yes. yes. Not according to Matt Dillahunty. Yeah. Um, so, okay. We, 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 we covered a lot. There's a lot of, I have a lot of notes here that I want to come back to. What I suggest is we take like a quick minute break and then gather the thoughts and then we'll be back in one minute. So we're going to explore the biblical corpus, as it were, to <laughs> reinstate the position of the father and rescue him from the belly of the whale, eh? Um, <laughs> young men are treated so terribly and it's just too much to bear. I said, I really went to Kermit the Frog. <laughs> Kermit the Frog. My Zizek's better than that. Um, okay, this is from the- Pure um, ideology. Pure ideology. I love it. It's beautiful. Um, the Tower of Babel or what? Perhaps you know it. I don't wish to borrow my, my Jewish friends. Um, it always has friends everywhere, doesn't it? My Chinese friends, they told me. I'm like, what Chinese friends? Come on. Uh, so the Tower of Babel, uh, people trying to build a way to heaven. This is from Mormon website. After the floods, the people began to disobey God. Some of them did not believe God's plan. Without asking God, they started building a tower to try to get to heaven. Is that correct? They were built. They were trying to get to heaven. Well, it, this is I think it's a kids, 
kid, um, a kids, version. Kids version. Because okay. again, it's one of the things, and it's a while since I've looked at this, so please forgive me. But one mm. of the things that it says in the original is that they were trying to make a name for themselves. Go, go to, go to the original, please, mate. Let's have a little look. Because that's what's interesting that they wanted to be known for posterity. Uh, could you uh, actually, if you look up, um, what's the? It's called Bible Gateway. Bible Gateway. That's where I go when I'm exploring the biblical corpus. There we there go. You go yeah. uh, now the whole world had one language. Does it start before this? No, no, no. It starts the, here. Chapter 11. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. Okay. They found a plane in Shinar. Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Yeah. Oh, the egotism there. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And remember, God had said, go forth and multiply. So God That's wanted just before people. this, in well, Genesis. Th this is the idea of the, the Jewish tribes separating and the d going out. And this mm. is the point that God wanted the people's, um, the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Yes. And one of the things that... Again, if you're not religious, this might be a massive turnoff. But I was reading, I can't remember the, the name of the guy. There's an American scholar I was reading. And he basically said, the problem with the Bible is it's been taken over by religious people. <laughs> and his point, but what he was trying to say was that actually, if you think of the Old Testament as a mm. humanist tract, mm. that's like, um, rather than a big bearded God in the sky, it's actually more of a Freudian projection of human values. That's given that the credit is given to a transcendental being, but basically the whole of the the Hebrew Bible is this um, humanist tract. In lots of ways, it's a human story that they've then projected onto God. So my, one of the points I'd make is that you can be a devout agnostic like me mm. and still treat the Bible incredibly seriously. So, is is another little um, what do you call it when you go off track? Not a diversion. Tangent, thank you. Um, when I read the book of Job, and I read it naively, I was like, just take it for what it is. Don't forget what you think you know. What is this? Uh, and I read the Garden of Eden story in the same way a few times over the years. I, I might, might cover this before, I'm not sure. But I was like, to me, this reads like theatre. I think perhaps this was supposed to be performed uh, for people. So if you read it as um, if you read it as as text, it has one meaning. If you read it almost, well, as no, a, I, I dispute that. It has layers of meaning. Sorry, and yes, often yes, contradictory. I'm yes, I'm sorry. That was that was incorrect. Uh, what I was trying to say is, if you take it as like this is direction for a film, this is direction for a play, this is poetry, this is a mystical revelation, this is history. These are all um, you told me ep epistemes, 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 which is the way in which you can understand in a period of time, in a chapter of history. And who's, who's is that? Foucault. Foucault. Um, Who, if you mentioned that, Stephen Hicks would have a heart attack. <laughs> God forbid we should learn anything from Foucault. Degenerate postmodern Marxist. So, so, so I looked at it and I was like, what is this? Let's say um, th this is, this is to be performed. Let's, let's, let's go with that. And it's not to be taken religiously and on faith when it says in the garden of eden story or first of all it's 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 funny the book of job is funny um god uh, satan flies up to heaven and goes do you want to bet with yeah, me but that's that also interestingly it's not necessarily satan as we understand it right from memory, I think if the original Hebrew, and this is it, if you actually read the book, I wish I read and spoke Hebrew. <laughs> no, because the, the, the Hebrew language is so crucial to all of yeah, this. Yeah. But I believe the concept of um, that, that Satan isn't used as a as a uh, personal name. No, Satan, I think, was an advocate. He's an adjudicator. Uh, so, exactly. Yeah, adjudicator, yeah. Yeah. So again, the, people get off on the wrong foot thinking this Satan is the devil with the horns yeah, with the he, tail. He, no, no, no. He, he, he's the, more like, ironically, the devil's advocate. Yeah, <laughs> but not the devil himself. Yes. Now, the minute you understand that bit of extra context, that opens up whole new realms of meaning. Because maybe at that time, intrinsic to Jewish philosophy was the idea of maybe some kind of a Socratic method. You have to have an opposition to know your position. So then shaitan 
the, the is that's my philosophical um adversary so that i can know my position maybe i don't know i don't know but that i was just making the point it's kind of funny the idea that he flies up to heaven and throws down a challenge and they place a bet and then they gamble on some poor guy's life and he's the most faithful person god has and he goes god's like he's not going to break faith and he goes he is Go and test him then. Gives him boils, gives him plagues, kills his family in the name of some stupid bet. So, so uh, the, the 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 thing I was just going to say, backing up your the thing that it's it might not be faith based, and we might not be able to see or understand. We might just not be capable of reaching to the way they interpreted it at that time. But one of the things I wanted to say is when it says and God said, that just meant. And it was so. So if that was an automatic interpretation, especially with the the, the um, Adam and Eve story, I take that as like a story of human evolution. Like you said, it's, it's humanist. That we, exper- we were like animals. We had no shame. Like cats walk around naked. Gods, walk, uh, gods, dogs, sorry, Freud and slip. Dogs walk around naked. They don't know. They can't sin because they don't know anything. But then with time and experience, you change and you grow and it's for the the ancient Jews, and God said, means immediately, and it came to be, and it was so. Because to them, God is maybe, I'm just positing an idea, maybe it's like a pantheistic view. It's like God is reality. God is that which is, and that was what was. And if God said, then that's what it, that's just what it, it's not to come, because uh, you mentioned the Greeks before, I'm wondering if part of our corruption in the understanding of all this is the Greek is like a Greek corruption. Gods are sort of human entities that you can argue with and they can get in a bad mood and they can fly down to earth because they're horny and turn into a swan and have sex with a woman and they get involved in human drama. Whereas th- maybe that's like an overlapping of something or, a, or an outgrowth or a mutation of it where there's something original here that's not about um, submission to a supreme being. There's a German philosopher, Peter, I think it's Peter, uh, Sloterdijk, Mm. um, S-L-O-T-E-R-D-I-J-K, I I think. Mm. Um, He's a a difficult read, but he has one of these ideas that basically um, myths and certain religious texts are like human... um, It's like our immune system Mm. in a cultural sense. Mm. So how do you deal with existential questions? That's great. So how does your body deal with external threats, mm-hmm. bacteria, etc.? Mm-hmm. You build up an immune system. Mm. Well, if you think of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, Greek myths, as this human cultural immune system, mm. it's how over time meaning has become sedimented through the generations. Right. And you're right, it does. It's very difficult for us to understand it as the ancient Hebrews would. Yeah. But... That's one aspect. The other aspect is the fact that we still understand so much of it. Yeah. 3,000 years later, it's yes. still yeah, it's amazing. Not, it's not missed. It's not totally missed. We're not sat there going, what are they talking about? This but there are the thing about layers upon layers. So, for example, you're talking about the Garden of Eden. I'd suggest mm. that um, God, being as wise as he was, must have known this idea. It's a false presentation, I'd suggest, the idea, you know, the, the, the tree of knowledge. Mm. It, it's set up, it's your point about the dramatic nature of it. It's set up that Eve tempts Adam and they take from the tree. But if you think about it, how could it go any other way? Yeah. Because if you stayed in the Garden of Eden forever, yes. you're not truly human. Yes. To yeah. human is to err. Yes. To yeah. human is to make mistakes. And that and that's why I, I'm probably not making the point that well because I'm not bright enough to do it, but that it's it's not saying Eve was bad or there was, it's just... Um, it's just, and it was, it, it, it just, that's, it's a, me, it's a, th- maybe my a theatrical metaphor for what did happen. And I don't know back in the day what they, when they took the archetype of female, cause we've got the Gnostic text, haven't we? And the archetype of male, when Eve chooses that, does she represent, uh, um, does she represent curiosity? Does she represent the growth of wisdom? Does is there some archetypal thing that we're we're missing? We go, oh, it's Eve. It's a bird. Well, and- I'd, I'd be a bit more blunt. I think men tend to think that they're todgers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what Eve's representing. Well, but is that is that like yeah? So is that 
Maybe, but is it is it one person? Adam is doing this. The, maybe like the crude way of being like that's the right side of the brain. That this isn't true. We know this isn't true anymore. And the left side of the brain, the intuitive side, not true, but okay, is Eve. And then the intuitive side says, "I wish to explore." We're jumping off here, but yeah. I did send you, and I'm sure you haven't read it because I send you endless amounts of rubbish. <laughs> but there is a fascinating. People need to um, check this guy out, Ian McGilchrist, mm. and he wrote the first book. He wrote was called "The Master and His Emissary," mm. and then he wrote, uh, I think it's called something like "The Matter of Things," mm. which are two big volumes. But the, the master and the emissary sums up his argument. Mm. But he was actually, he came from a literature background, but he became a neuroscientist. Mm. And it's your point about the left-right side. Oh, okay. It's about the hemispheres. Ah. And he basically argues, I've, I hope I've got the, I always get them mixed up, mm. but I basically, people who are right-handed, mm. like I am, um, it's the left hand, your left-hand side of your brain controls the right-hand side yes. of your body. Yeah. But the left hemisphere of the brain tends to be more organized towards grasping things. Mm-hmm. Um, science, basic, it, it can be quite intellectually like conceptual, but mm. um, it's not about ambiguity. The right side of the brain mm. that controls the left hand yeah. is more about, you're saying intuition, creativity. I think I swapped them, didn't I, there? See, yeah, yeah, seeing yeah. patterns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting that Leonardo da Vinci, I think there's a disproportionate number of creative musical people, for example, mm. are left-handed. Mm. A lot of actors are left-handed. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's... The, so, and he may, he, he's at pains. He's a neuroscientist. And I think in his second two volumes, he quotes 6,000 scientific papers to back up his case. So I, I'm very comfortable talking he's a about... Reader. Well, I'm very comfortable talking about literature and stuff. That's, you know, my mm. shtick. But he's looking at it from a neuroscientific point of view. Mm. And his, to bring all this back to the, the present day, what he's suggesting is we live in a culture mm. that is privileging the... the, the um, Left side. The right-handed left left hemisphere. Okay. Seeing the most... Not seeing complex patterns. Yes. So, it's blue weird. herd ideology. Yes. Not yeah. seeing complex patterns. Literature encourages senses of the Bible, encourages mm. sense of ambiguity. Mm. We've just been debating the Garden of Eden because mm. it's not clear. No. The story of Babel isn't clear. No. It's encouraging you to metaphors mm. or a way of seeing the world. It's trying to interpret it in a more complex patterned way mm. rather than. But if you want to build a bridge, mm. you don't want complex metaphorical patterns. No. You want something that works. Yes. And McGill Chris's point is the human brain has always been the fact it's divided bicamerally yeah. into two sections. It's yeah. asymmetrical, the brain. Yes. That in itself, he points out, is just fascinating. Most most developed animals have this divided brain. Mm. And the point is, so these two things are always going on at the same time. Mm. But our culture has rapidly overprivileged the left-hand side of the brain. And this yes. goes back to what earlier on we are talking about mobile phone use. Yes. The fact that people don't read anymore. Yes. They're not engaged in literature. They've yes. become more and more Babylonially, ideologically driven. Yes. There's only one cuneiform truth. Yes. This, there's actually, you know, quite a strong neuroscience argument now to mm. suggest that this is getting worse. And he cites some casual empiricism, but if any listeners are, you know, involved in educating young kids, mm. the number of kids entering school now that are having trouble, trouble recognizing facial emotions, mm. they're not autistic, mm. but they're actually because there the seems to be a, as a species we're actually in some senses going backwards. Oh, well. We're emotionally less developed because of some of the over-focus upon narrow aspects of modern technological life. There's my uh, friend, uh, Professor Ed Dutton, the evolutionary psychologist, uh, he's told me a number of times that we're dropping an IQ point every year at the current rate. <laughs> One point a year, to, to, according to the IQ specialist. I, I, I don't understand IQ tests for that well to be able to check it, but that's what he's telling me. It's, a, it's an IQ point a year. Which is rapid. I, if I've misquoted him, I apologise. It's it, but it's it's. But it's, also IQ it's tests are it's a whole other realm of that they're measuring a very narrow yes. sliver. Yes, but it's still it's. I would uh, I agree. I would argue it's it's a meaningful data point. It's a, it's a significant data point. Bring bring up the Tower of Babel because we're into our last half hour and I have about fifty things that I need to ask uh, uh, Paul. Um, let's do this Tower of Babel thing uh, because. It look it it looks like your your premise is is the right one. So uh, go on, make it big again. He said. Uh, <laughs> 
If, Sorry, we've just morphed into Benny Hill <laughs> If as one people speak in the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. But just, sorry, to stop you there, when it says mm. on line five, but the Lord came down to see the city. And this is one of the funny things, like, the Lord wouldn't have to come down. Wait, what's the Lord? Is he like Darth Vader or Emperor Harkonnen flying around but the, the God, ceiling? The God as an omniscient being doesn't need to come down yeah. anywhere. He knows exactly <laughs> what's happening. So this is part of the levels of meaning yes. and how seriously do you take the idea? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, and scattered them all over the earth. They stopped building the city because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now, you said to me on the break, it, it is short, the Tower of Babel story, uh, that I think you said it on break and we should say it on, on the podcast. You are pedantic enough to go and read the published work by Hebrew scholars that interpret these and that Babel might have meant channel. Yeah, I need to reread. It was a long time since I read the article, but th we get the word Babel, mm. and the idea is from the word Babel. Mm. So the idea of this confusion of languages, but mm. there's, I think it's from the University of Jerusalem, I was reading this paper where he's suggesting that there is a word, um, he's tracing the etymology of the Hebrew and the Babylonian, and he's arguing, I think it was the word channel. And I think... Uh, the city of Babel was in this confluence of these rivers mm. and it's why people came together into a conurbation of the city. So he's arguing that Babel actually might be more to do with the concept of people being channeled together. Mm. And that's what Babylon did as an empire. Mm. That's what the Roman Empire did. It mm. channeled people into this uni-logical, you know, there's one way of doing things the Roman way, there's one way of doing things the Babylonian way. Yes. And we now have the new Babylonian woke ideology. There's only one way of understanding. Would In the guise of diversity, we will never have diversity ever again. There's no diversity of thought, only diversity of But of this skin, is fascinating because tone. the Tower of Babel is there is only one language. Right. We're back. We've actually regressed. We're going backwards. We're going back to only one language, no di no genuine diversity. And if you step outside of the rules of that language, you're guilty of blasphemy and brought up on religious crime charges effect effectively. Yeah, and no, I just think for, for it's, I think I said at the time, it's roughly 18 lines, are, are probably mm. about right. Mm -hmm. But there is so much in there mm. from such a short text. And the point is, this was saying about sedimented meaning over time and over centuries. This means, to, so we can talk about this in relation to woke, mm. whereas your ancient Hebrews wouldn't have that experience. No. So this is one of the fascinating aspects of there's, there's the actual need to translate into other languages, but there's also the need to translate into the time you find yourself in. Speak, speaking of the time, is... Uh, obviously, there's there's original African American woke, which we've discussed before, which was being aware of systemic racism in, in America. Now, a bunch of white liberal privileged kids have have, have reappropriated that. And we have white woke, which is the mess of radical leftist ideas mixed in and and not very well understood. Is this is this a result of World War II? Meaning, uh, we saw the totalitarianism of of Stalinism and of Hitlerism on the rise. It was defeated, let's say, or fell in on itself. We, the British colonizers of the world said, that's bad. All forms of totalitarianism and empire building are bad. Let's not do that. And therefore, in a sense that that set off, um, so it's a big explosion, a big event, and then it pushes a sort of a tidal wave of consciousness in a certain direction that then just goes too far. Well, it's more, ironically, if you want to go back to um, the book, the, the wisdom books, so um, Ecclesiastes, mm. there's nothing new under the sun. Right. And th this is one of the ironies. There is nothing new under the sun. So I was reading about, again, all these difficult books I'm looking at. Mm. Uh, Dostoevsky, in the Alexander II, in the Russian Empire, Tsar Alexander II, um, Dostoevsky's writing, I think 1861, the serfs were emancipated. Mm. And you've got, it's a very febrile time in the Russian Empire. And it gave, right at this period, that you you've, will have heard the phrase intelligentsia. Mm -hmm. That actually meant it has nothing to do with intellectuals. Oh. 
which is misleading. Mm -hmm. But I've been reading the various ways this author was trying to explain what it meant. All it meant was um, how loyal you were to the party line. At the time, there wasn't the Communist Party, but in the early days of radicalism, mm. so Dostoevsky's writing against these early radicals. He was one himself for a short period of time. Mm. But he's writing against them. And what he's saying is, to be part of the intelligentsia, all you had to do was be loyal to the, the current radicalism. Which would have been... Was anti-culture. So there's a story that Tolstoy uh, kept his count, he used his title mm. all the time mm. to annoy them. Right. Because to be part of the intelligentsia, you just had to be loyal to the idea that everything had to be torn down. Oh, so intelligentsia was the woke of the time. Yeah. They're, they're saying we... We are the illuminated. This is my point. Ah. So my point is, if you were living in 1860s in mm, Russia, mm. the current woke trend would be nothing new. You would recognise it. Uh, and this is... And the, I'm sorry, and back, because my book, uh, my people don't read anymore, these yeah. intelligentsia would pride themselves. Mm. So uh, what is to be done is it Chernyshevsky. There was this famous book that was one of Lenin's favourite. It was, a, it was a really atrocious, like a Mills and Boone novel for mm. revolutionaries. Mm. It was awful. What, what's it called? Uh, what is to be done. Okay. And it was this, but it was this radical, so, you know, it was, it was cardboard cutout characters, but they mm. were revolutionaries. Mm. And th this is what, and Lenin swore by it. And people like Tegenev and Dostoevsky, these brilliant writers, Tolstoy, mm. were just thinking it was an absolute joke of a book. Yeah. It was, it was hilariously bad. Yeah. But this is the point. Its artistic merit had nothing to do with anything. It was the exposition of the cardboard cutout characters that were just spouting whatever the political narrative. Of, and it's of the, the, there is something, it's the, the, the purity, and it's happened in Mao's China. Mm. The purity it happened in Pol Pot, mm. in Cambodia. Mm. It is quite, and when I worked in a university system, I very rarely got given a job of any responsibility. But if I ever, if you're ever in the belly of the bureaucracy, there is something very seductive about knowing the whole weight of that bureaucracy is behind you. Right. So I could tell a colleague, you have to do this, knowing if they argued, mm. I could bring down the weight of this bureaucratic beer moth. Mm -hmm. And that is the purity. So it's got, and I knew some very, very nice academics. The minute they entered the bureaucratic mindset, mm. they became horrible creatures. And we've discussed this before in, in terms of the Nazis and in terms of Stalin. When you're, when the bureaucratic mindset, it's a horrible, pure, Mm. There's a purity. There's no ambiguity. This, we're talking about ambiguity in literature. Mm. The point about bureaucracy is it reduces everything mm. to a widget that fits within a system of widgets. And everything has to be treated the same. And you can see how this led to the death camps. This led to uh, Kalima, the area of Eastern um, Soviet Union, where they sent people to the camps. Um, the Kalima River, they, they called it going to Kalima. Mm. Um the mentality, so it, it didn't matter if they were Nazis, didn't matter if they were Stalinists. The mentality is the same. It's this bureaucratic, um, you know, there's the horrible racism that was intrinsic to Hitler. But beyond that, mm. if, if you were living under Stalin or under Hitler, it's a bit of a Hobson's choice, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, and well, you have, you have evidence of people switching sides during that time because it just, I think we look back on the ideology through history, is it, I'm sorry, it's epist epistemes. Epistemes. So the episteme that we live in now can't be that different to World War II, but it probably is different in some significant coordinates, right? Well, what, what scares me, if you think back to Pol Pot, mm. year zero, mm. you think of all the things these totalitarian mindsets want to do. The first thing they want to do is destroy history. So year zero, take everything back. The end of history. Yeah, destroy the czar system, which yeah. they had good reasons. It was a horrible system, but uh, the French Revolution, the irony was with the French Revolution, they had to recreate religion. They had to invent a new religion because mm. they realised, oops, we've got rid of everything that means anything. Yes. So Robespierre created this mad religion. They're based on... The supreme being, I think they called it. Yeah, yeah. It's and, almost but, like an Illuminati-style... Thing wasn't it? It was. It was, it was just Catholicism. Why is it? Was, right. <laughs> but, but let's take the priests away. But let's recreate this nonsense. Yeah. 
And uh, this, this to me is this, um, but when you take everything away, when you take context away, when you take art, literature, the genuine intelli intellectuals, so the intelligentsia get rid of the real intellectuals, all of this is designed to genuine debate, genuine ambiguity, genuine nuance. Mm. All of these things are gone. So what are you left with? Mm. Purity. Purity of thought. And it's it's this enjoyable sense. Um, Darkness at Noon, uh, K Kessler's book, it's an amazing psychological insight into because people caught up in this in, in Stalin's time. People would actually, the, the higher ups would mm. periodically be thrown in uh, it was a Lubyanka prison. Yeah. And it's like, well, but they then, they still enthusiastically sometimes took part in their own show trials because yes. they didn't want to betray the revolution. Yes. And they said, well, I must have done something wrong. Yes. And that's how deep it gets into people's souls. I don't, I don't know if it's historically accurate or if it's just uh, like a, a bit of artistic license, but in the movie Death of Stalin, before people are executed, their final words before they're shot are praise of Stalin. The, you know, it's, it's whatever the equivalent of the Heil Hitler was. There's, well, there's a fascinating, there's also why you think about it if for such an atheistic structure like Stalinism. Mm. Why do they need this overinvestment of the emotionality of the victims Yes, to almost convince Stalin and his cronies there's, there's an excess, isn't mm. there? Yes. There's an excess sadism. Yes. Oh, God, yeah. But you... But that, it fascinates me. Why? Why aren't they just happy with the fact they have ultimate control? Right. Why do they have to have this ex excess? It's not just that we execute you. We have to execute you with you singing our name. Yes. Yeah. And what I'd suggest is that's what people underestimate about the whole woke thing. There's some type of emotional investment in being right. Mm. People think they're correct. People think they're pure. That, right. And there's an emotionality that I think people don't realise how important that is. Because in a, in, a, in a Western culture now that lacks religion, that lacks literature, mm. that lacks these sources of meaning, this is where people are getting meaning from. And is the, is the excess born of revenge? Is it, it's got to be some kind of emotional impulse that, that, that predicates the excess. I just know, I think it's, it's part, you're the psychological expert. I think it's partly sadistic. Um, Satan is enjoyable. Yes. But it's partly, it provides meaning, even if it's sadistic meaning. Yes. If, if you've taken history away, if you've taken context away, if you've taken ambiguity away and you're left with purity of meaning, mm. that in a world where religion no longer matters to a lot of people, mm. that provides you with a lot of solace. I can go on a march now with my friends mm. and shout slogans. Mm and feel part of a communal body that's lacking oh, yeah. in I'm, any other area of my life. I'm sure there's euphoria in that. I'm sure there's a great sense. Of, I think it appeals to to us as human beings. I think there's there's a lot of reward. As, but as you historically, you know, going through religions and all these forms of meaning, mm. that was the human cultural immune system, finding ways to create structures to channel these type of emotions. And my point is, well, we've lost a lot of the cultural channeling mm. and we're left with these really dangerous, inchoate, pure things. Anything that's so pure just makes me so suspicious. Yes. And one of its symptoms, I was going to say, is uh, certainty. When people are very, very yeah. certain. I'm like, where'd you go? Where do you buy your certainty from? Can I go to the Asda and buy some I certainty? think you're a bit like me. I will argue with myself. Yeah. yeah. Get to a certain point. <laughs> yeah, I'll start, to. Yeah, you're talking rubbish. Who's that? <laughs> Shut up. You're talking rubbish. Why would you think that? Yeah. Yeah. I have that. I have that. Um, uh, you've, you've got me on this excess thing. I know there's something there and I'm going to have to, in my own time, come back to it mm. because there's, there's, there's something there. Um, and I think if I've got this intuition, if you unlock that, you'll probably see what's really motivating the totalitarian systems and the real desire. And it will, if you unlock it, you reveal the hypocrisy. Yeah, somehow. but I'd, I'd counsel against always thinking there has to be a proactive motivation. I'm leaning, my thoughts are leaning more to the notion that, to repeat, because we've taken away a lot of traditional forms, mm. very powerful. Mm. So the wisdom, the wisdom books and the, the Hebrew Bible. Mm. This is condensed wisdom of millennia of people. Mm. The Greek myths. Mm. 
human experience condensed down and down and down. Yeah. And there's real wisdom contained within it. Oh, God. And we as a society have said, sod all that. Sod all that. We are going to recreate some weird, simplistic, sloganistic phrases, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that is some Maoist... The Maoist Red Book is back in human resources departments. <laughs> the, the, the strange thing of all that, because I was asked, uh, I was in a, a talk in Croatia recently, and now Croatia, the, the, the Balkans slowly is getting a taste of, of the woke mind virus. And a woman who's there, a white woman, very sincerely asked me, when I see foreigners here, I notice I have racist thoughts. Help me to deal. How do I fight this racism that is inside of me? And I said, don't. Don't try to be anti-racist because that's like pinching a blood vessel. That leads to intellectual, spiritual anemia. Try to think, what am, what am I experiencing? Here is a foreigner. I'm not used to foreigners. I'm raised Catholic in Croatia. I'm surrounded by white people. Now as a foreigner, I'm having a thought. Be kind. So I'm saying, my point here is don't engage in not something. To, to try to not be something it's absurd. It's always going to be anemic. It's always going to lead to neurosis. Try to be kind. Try to be rational. Try to be reasonable. Critique your own thoughts. Try to grow. Fine. But don't try Don't try to not do something. Well, you don't have to be Freud to think there's a lot of danger to be found in repression. Right. We both went to Catholic school. Yes. Yes, we know. <laughs> we know the madness that can ensue. Um, we've got 15 minutes left and I have about three hours worth of questions. So... Good luck to me. Um, this thing of, of, of literacy and needing to read, what's the benefit? Why should I read a long book? Well, I'm, I'm not having a go at you because mm. you, you now in my mind are representative of all life coaches everywhere. <laughs> but I'm genuinely fascinated why um, literature hasn't been used in life coaching more. And tell me whether it has. I'm assuming it hasn't. No. And we're the, we're the shortcut brain hack people if it's life coaching, yeah. But, you know, if, if, if I, my dream is some rich Russian oligarch um, installs me on his yacht and basically says... We're here, discuss, we're ready. Discuss Dostoevsky with me four hours a day. The other two hours you can play backgammon with me <laughs> and I'll set up a dartboard <laughs> and we'll have a fridge full of Nigerian Guinness. Uh, just saying if there's any... Here you know, is his fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> if Oleg is out there... And if he's, Oleg's he's, out there, mate, he, we'll wait for the call. He sold a few gas companies. I'm, I'm your man. But seriously... um. For example, I'll give you what um, I was talking before about, you know, the amount of effort you'd have to put in to read difficult books. If you look at um, a la recherche de Tom Badu in Search of Lost Time. Mm. Now, it's different formats, but there's a short modern library edition, the six volumes. And um, so they're relatively short paperbacks, but thick. Six mm. volumes, just the text, if you ignore all the notes. Mm. Not that I'm a nerd, but it's 4,007 4,374 pages. But if you if you divide the <laughs> Don't that, be scared, read a book. <laughs> no, but 10 hours a week. Yeah. Now, most people, if you said, most people haven't read In Search of Lost Time, but if you said, right, to the people who haven't read it, what do you know anything about it? And most people will have heard about the story of the Madeleines. Mm. Have you heard of the... They're like little cakes. Mm. And the point is... It's about, in the paperback version, about volume one, about 65 pages, 60 pages in. Mm. Um, it, the book starts off, he's a little Lord Fauntleroy character, yeah. the narrator, this Marcel. And he's in bed waiting for his mother to come up and kiss him, and she won't because she's entertaining guests. Right. So he's this hysterical, it's, it's quite funny. Um, and Mama won't come up and kiss me. And it goes yeah. on for 60 bloody pages. Right. Now, I understand why a lot of people reading this laugh. God, yeah. they want to strangle him. Yeah. But then suddenly, around 60 pages, he's, he's then an adult. It flips and he's an adult. And he's at uh, an auntie's house and he dips this little cake in tea. Mm. And um, a memory comes flooding back. Mm. And it's called, he had this theory of involuntary memory and it was based upon, there was a French philosopher called Henri Bergson yeah. who developed the concepts of duration. Yes. So it's all about, you know, guess what? The book's called In Search of Lost Time. Mm. It's about time. So you have to suffer 60 pages mm. of this little Lord Fauntleroy being a spoiled little brat. Mm. But then you get this amazing, insightful, 
all these involuntary memories come flooding back because the cake he's eating as an adult reminds him mm. of something that happened many, many decades good, earlier. Good psychotherapeutic lesson. But the point is, he said, if you try and... It, it, the, the, the key thing is it's involuntary. Yes. You can't control it. Yes. And any memories you have conscious control over have been filtered mm. through your, your, your consciousness, your subconscious, mm. whereas involuntary memories... The, and then throughout the book, throughout 4,000-odd pages, there are a periodic moments. It's like a symphony. There's a rhythm. Mm. And one of these memories, one of these events will happen. Mm. I think there's about 13 throughout the 4,000 pages. And in amongst all that, there's one particular item that we talked about, sadism. Mm. He's a little boy and he's outside some bedroom. He's fallen asleep in a garden. Mm. And they've described a father has died and um, he was very, he was a snob. Mm. And he was a um, composer, a music teacher. And he had a daughter who he absolutely idolised. His wife had died and left him traumatised, idolises the daughter. He's obsessed about how he appears to people. Mm. And his daughter has a lesbian affair and her lover comes into the house while he's still alive. Mm. Um, so he's shamed in front of the whole town in those days. Mm. But he puts up with it because he loves his daughter so much. He dies and the boy is in the garden. It's a, it's a bit convoluted the way he ends up in the garden, but he can see into the bedroom. And they start um, fooling around, but there's a photograph of the father. Mm. And she says, the daughter says to her lover, and encourages her to spit on the photograph as part of this sadistic game playing. Right. And all that father has done, it, it went against every value he held dear about his social status. Mm. He backed his daughter Mm. And even when he's dead, she gets a sadistic kick. Mm. And again, you've read about this little Lord Fauntleroy prancing about the French countryside. Mm. And then all of a sudden, you've got one of the darkest bits of sadism I've read in literature. Yeah. yeah. That is uh, psychologically, and he discusses the sadism, the enjoyment mm. of encouraging someone to spit on a photograph. Mm. And without, and one of the points I'd like to make is without the endless pages of this little Lord Fauntleroy prancing about, yeah. it wouldn't be so affecting. No, you can't. You can't get there quickly. And that's a point. So to take back to life coaching, everyone wants a quick fix. Yeah. Everyone wants an immediate problem to your solutions. Yes. But how about you learn that if you actually work as a mean, like getting fit mm. requires effort. Mental health, psychological insights takes effort. It, and to get that level of insight mm. and then to see over 4,000 pages how someone can construct a rhythm like music, mm. that is... And yeah, I know it's a ball ache to read that many, but if you did the 10 hours a week of reading... Interesting. You're preaching to the choir here. I have this thing that I say to people about reading because I just... Uh, Tyler, who was in yesterday, he's now bought the Brothers Karamazov and he's, he's going to read. He's a bodybuilder. Um, and he's also, he, he sends me texts and he's asking about Nietzsche. How do I understand this? What does it mean? So we have like a back and forth on that. And what I've been saying to people is if, if you li literally want to improve the quality of your consciousness and your thinking, what I found is reading helps, even if it's boring. You got me to read a Kafka book. I didn't enjoy it. But when I read it, the thoughts I had afterwards in, because my brain's going, why are we, what's this? Why is he talking about, who's that? Who's The quality of my thoughts went up. When I scroll Instagram or TikTok, the quality of my thinking goes down. And I was like, why is that? Well, in this scenario, when I'm reading a book, I don't really understand. I'm not really enjoying or, or, or life and fate, which was fairly hard slog. My brain is active and it's interacting and it's pulling, I have to, what's he saying? What's this weird Russian reference to who, to what? My brain's there pulling these pieces together. It's talking to itself. It's talking to its representation of the author. It's active. When I'm scrolling Instagram, the content, the AI, the algorithms, they're actually thinking for me and they're feeling for me. It's like Zizek's uh, laughter track uh, concept. It's canned laughter. Yeah. Canned laughter, canned laughter. He's, it's doing everything for me. And I'm like, when I do this and I'm scrolling, I am a wank sock for Satan's jizz. That I'm doing nothing. I'm receiving evil spunk into my brain. When I'm reading a, a hard, like the Kafka book's not a hard text, but 
I just didn't like his nasty little world. I just didn't, but I went there because I knew we'd have this conversation. I wanted to say, I read it. And the quality of my thinking afterwards improved. And even my, my desire to write, my desire to create, everything, everything improved. When I do that, when I follow that exercise, when I do this, Can I don't I tell you a quick story about anything. Valmar Shalomov mm. is a Russian writer. And I read one of his short stories. It was quite funny. Um, th this is how, it's backing up what you're saying, but it's also, if I could be evangelical to people, it would be, mm. there is joy to be found in darkness. Mm. And the example I want to give is, I, I was doing some research into people who, in the death camps, both uh, the Nazi death camps and the Stalinist death camps, mm. actually found literature mm. to be incredibly, you'd think, well, what could be less useful? Mm. And Primo Levi, um, if this was a man, I think his book was, where he's in Auschwitz, and he, he has a conversation with a, with a friend and he gets to talk to him about uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. Mm. And he, he's quoting bits from him. He said he was never more alive because mm. it meant something that amidst all this inhumanity, he mm. could access something that gave him a sense of humanity. Yes. But this Shalomov, he wrote a short story and it's just very economically called Marcel Proust. <laughs> so he's in Kalima, one of the uh, prison camps, <laughs> and there's a nurse. He's sat mm. on a concrete bench and he's found a volume of Proust mm. and it's put, he puts it down next to him. And he's talking to this nurse that he recognises from his past mm. and she's quite an attractive woman. And he says, what are you doing here? The death camp, you, you, you're, or the work camp, sorry. Mm. You're a nurse. Um, she said, well, I refused to sleep with one of my bosses on the outside. Mm. So I got sent here. Mm -hmm. So he, he chats to her and then she leaves and the book's gone. And he's, he's like, he's devastated. And then a few weeks later, he sees her again and she's a shadow of the person she was. She looks terrible. Mm. And he goes, what's wrong? And she goes, I've been sent here for good now because I've got syphilis. Mm. Um, and he goes, well, how the hell did you get that? And she goes, well, I slept with the guy who runs your camp mm. because she'd been sent to the camps because she wouldn't sleep. Now she'd had to sleep with someone. She's got syphilis. And she goes, and by the way, I was the one who stole your book. Full stop. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it's only about four or five pages. Yeah. And yeah. I read the title thing. Oh, this will be about how Proust helped him in prison. <laughs> and it's the most, you just think you've been punched in the stomach. Yes. And he kicks you in the head. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there must be part of me yeah. who is a Russian peasant. Yeah. Because I find this, not funny is the wrong word. Yeah. But I, I warm to, to be that dark, you have yeah. to have a sense of humour. Yes. Yes. And there's a level, and Solzhenitsyn, basically, Zizek slags um, Solzhenitsyn off. Yeah. And says, if he was any good, he would have written like Shalomov. <laughs> <laughs> and Solzhenitsyn on the back of the book gives an endorsement and says, to be fair, but towards the effect of in Russian, to be fair, um, Shalomov writes about the awfulness of the camps better than I do. <laughs> so if you find Solzhenitsyn too heartwarming, yeah. read Shalomov. Shalomov, <laughs> go, go one level darker. <laughs> Um, we're, we're coming into the last few minutes now. Um, life and faith. Did you, did you finish that? I'm, you, I'm about two, page 250 and then I got distracted, but I promise you faithfully, I will finish it. There's two passages from that book that I decided early last year, I wanted to read on the philosophy channel. Yeah. Um, they're both, they both involve, uh, well, one's, one's a description of entering a gas chamber from a, uh, they're both from a woman's point of view. It's written by a man, uh, Vitaly Goodman, Grossman. Grossman. Uh, and the other one I, I can't even talk about because I'll start, I'll start welling up, um, is a letter written by a mother to a son and mm. she, know, she knows she's going to die. And I wanted to read this on the philosophy channel. And then October the 7th happened and I thought, I can't share that because if I share that, there'll be spam comments underneath these beautiful, heartbreaking pieces of writing that will just say free Palestine, free Palestine, free Palestine with Palestinian flag flags. And the point of wanting to read it is to say, this is hard literature. This, if you can listen to this and not be moved, you're, you're made of stone. I want to share it with you. And I want, it's not about being pro any team. It's not like I'm pro Jewish, I'm pro Muslim. It's not that. It's a horrifying human experience and appeal to say, let's never do this again. But I can't. Because you know what will happen if I well, do that. Well, except this is, I'd like to, my, my final contribution I'd, I'd love to be is this idea that what I think, and I wish the Jewish community would do more of this. Who am I to tell them what to do? Yeah. 
But I think there's a temptation, and I understand why you have to do it. You have to go on YouTube. You have to go on TV mm. and defend what Israel's doing. And mm. you, you have to. You, you go into defensive mode. But if if the dust ever does clear, mm. I just wish the Jewish community would do more with the, in, the, in the West to bring people like Bielik, the poet, mm. to people's consciousness. It's exactly the point you've just made. Yeah. If people read In the City of Slaughter... Yeah. I challenge you. And then you forget the spamming idiots, the yeah. trolls. Yeah. But you'll get through to quite a few people. Yes. And they still may not be convinced. They're never going to be fans of the IDF. Yes. But you say, read that Bielik poem, mm. and then look me in the face and say, you don't understand a little bit more how Jewish people think. Yeah. And that's how I think you're going to win the hearts and minds. It may never... I'm very pessimistic. I'm not an optimist. But I think if you're ever going to achieve anything... Mm. It's actually not through trying to debate people on YouTube because it's parallel monologues. People yes. don't listen anymore. No, no. But if you can make them read Grossman, yeah. read Bielik, yes, and get a sense that, hang on, and it, it may not affect them for a couple of months afterwards, but yeah. trust me, like a Proustian involuntary memory, yes, powerful literature hits you over the head. Oh, God. It's transformative, honestly. Just, just thinking about it, it's like... Whew. Yeah, so I, I I think that in terms of bang for book, the irony is I think the most effective, productive thing people can do is the weirdest, abstruse poetry. Yeah. It's the weird... No, it's the thing that you think least of. And if people think I'm mad, I just repeat. They do. Fine. <laughs> But you read the people in the death camps, you read mm. Viktor Frankl, mm. and he said the people who survived the death camps, the mm. strongest, mm. weren't big muscly men. Mm. He said there were people with a sense of meaning. Yeah. Primo Levi, unfortunately, ended up committing suicide on the outside, mm. but he survived the horrors of Auschwitz mm. by partly keeping in his head Dante. Right. Now, my point would be, if literature is so useful, you, you've said to me, I'll keep going back to the question, why read? Yeah. If Dante can keep someone mm. through the inferno, I use the word advisedly, the mm. inferno of Auschwitz, mm. that is pretty powerful. When yes. people think literature doesn't have any use, yeah. it, I, you know, you or I would, would be snowflakes in a, in a desert sun yeah. in Auschwitz. We yeah. wouldn't last seconds. No. <laughs> but these people survived the horrors. Yeah. What? By being able to recall great literature that gave them a sense of humanity. Yes. Now, no, you know, flicking through a phone will ever give you that. Can't. They no can't. trying to debate someone who's decided before they even begin speaking to you, they're not going to listen. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's the only way. I don't think there is much hope left, but if there is any hope... <laughs> It's in Shalomov and syphilitic nurses stealing proofs. <laughs> and on that note, we probably should leave it. Um, Dr. Paul, thank you very much for coming in again. It's always Cheers. a pleasure. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. And we look forward to speaking to you again soon. Cheers. <laughs>